Hi. Hey. So, Logan, here we are, all the way from Miami, Florida, to Washington, D.C., at the NEA Symposium. Hi, everybody. Hey. Um, and you are a community organizer. And you are Afro-Latinx, you're a trans-masculine, non-binary person of color. And most importantly, you have a lot to share with us, really important insights about the promise of public education. So what's brought you here today? So it was an evening after work, um, fairly early in the evening, you know, sun is just beginning to set. And I was laying on my bed, surrounded by concert memorabilia and posters about trans liberation. And as I was leisurely just scrolling through Twitter, I stumbled across a tweet that struck me and it stayed with me. And it said, if you were a gifted kid in elementary school, there's a 100% chance that you're gay and depressed now. And initially I laughed because I'm queer and I'm also diagnosed with depression. But I noticed when a, I noticed that when a close friend retweeted it, I had a really sobering moment of realization. And it was almost everybody who I was with in the biomedical and agriculture magnet program has either experienced or is experiencing some form of depression. And when you look at the number of people who have passed away due to suicide or drug overdoses, there's an alarming truth that no one is looking at. And it's that millennials on forward are in a very intense mental health crisis and no one is talking about it. So, you know, as you know, it's very easy to connect depression to a tumultuous home life, but there's another connection that oftentimes people fail to make, mm -hmm. and the connection to the school system. So what do I mean by that? The school, school in its, of itself is seen as a safe home away from home that's all about the wellness and success of students. But the unfortunate truth is that schools perpetuate the same systems of oppression that we're fighting against. So we're talking about class-based systemic oppression and race-based systemic oppression, which is oftentimes internalized. Yeah. So oppression. Can you say more about what that is, what that looks like? What are you talking about when you say that? Okay, so first let's take a look at like the geographical inequity. It's, it's not a secret that low-income schools are completely underfunded and under-resourced. What's interesting is that in the state of Florida, there's a guidance plan mandate, but there's no mandate for an actual school counselor. So what that means is that if you attend a low-income school, you're either at risk of losing your school counselor or you don't have one at all. Whereas wealthier schools have, you know, the extra dollars to invest it in their students' wellness, while lower income schools don't, yeah. and they don't have to invest in their students. And then there's also the piece around identity politics, right? So depending on the intersections of your identity, it exposes you to, ex exposes you to a certain level of trauma in schools. So, for example, black and Latino girls face higher rates of suspension than their white counterparts, and they're also met with harsher and way more punitive measures than their white counterparts. Yeah. And there's also some really disturbing information about trans students and their experiences. So, I mean, 47% of trans students have admitted that within a 30-day period, they've skipped school at least once. 50% of trans students have admitted that they've seriously contemplated suicide, and there's a very direct link between harassment in schools and low GPAs. And that's not even to mention all of the trauma and stress that's triggered by over-militarization in schools. And because of the utopian school myth that we all believe in, students are not getting the support they need or deserve. Yeah. So some, some people might say, like, how would you respond if someone said, okay, that's probably just a few isolated cases. This sounds kind of like a fringe perspective. How big of a problem is this really? So, I mean, the statistics can speak for themselves, right? But there's also tremendous value in actually listening to the experience of students. So I was able to find a tweet um, that really talked about the experience, and it reads, after seven hours of school, I should be able to come home and chill, but no. I have to sit down and do three hours of homework. When will this stop? Why do we have to act like this is normal and acceptable? The system is so messed up and harmful. School is the leading cause of my depression. So, you know, we talk a lot about, like, what it is, so what is the impact, right? So what happens when students leave the school system by however they leave it, 
whether they're pushed out or whatnot, they're, they can be faced with increased mental health issues as they attempt to unlearn all of the toxic behaviors and ideals that was instilled in them from their experience in the school system. Yeah. And there's also this really intense and tricky stigma about seeking mental health services. So what if you don't normalize it in grade school? When you get to a point where you're like, hey, I may need to see a therapist, it's intimidating and it's, you know, foreign. But on the flip side, there, it's a double-edged sword. The help that you can receive in school isn't always help that has the student's best interest in mind. So because of all these things that pile on top of each other, unfortunately, that means that not all of us survive. Suicide is the second leading cause of death for young folks between the ages of 10 to 24, which includes college-age youth, which means, to put it into perspective, more young, young adults and youth die from suicide than cancer, heart issues, AIDS, birth defects, stroke, pneumonia, the flu, and lung issues combined, and it's absolutely terrifying. Yeah. So this is a really big problem, clearly. Uh, can you tell us a little bit about where you are in all of this? So my experience in the school system was pretty intense. Uh, my dad emigrated to the States in the 80s from Colombia, um, you know, for the promise of a good education. My mom, she didn't want to be living in the projects for the rest of her life across the street from Edison Senior High School. She wanted to get out of the hood by any means necessary. And for her, that meant education, because that was the only way that you could get out. So as you can imagine, a lot of the messaging that I received around education was pretty intense and toxic for my development. And then, of course, all the trauma that I accumulated before and after my mom passed away while I was still in high school. So I had to graduate by any means necessary, and I did. But was it all truly worth it? I'm honestly not sure. Yeah. So you are a community organizer. Can you tell us a little bit about what all of this means in your community organizing? Yeah, so I started organizing after my mom passed away, so about four or five years, give or take. Um, and I've heard and I've witnessed a lot of things in those years. And one of the most powerful things that I witnessed was when we were holding a series of circles under the Black Girls Matter um, Miami Coalition. And during the Closing Leadership Summit, there was a Q&A panel and a foreign principal stood up and was basically asking, how can you help black girls when they have such abhorrent attitudes and don't respect themselves? Very heavy engagement in like respectability politics. And the youth responded with authenticity and truth. They pointed out that when black girls act out, it comes from somewhere and it comes from pain and hurt and trauma. And instead of chastising them, actually listen to them and value them. All she could do was take a seat. The youth organizers felt truly empowered and finally heard. The principal gained a deeper understanding of what it meant to be trauma-informed. And this is what happens when you invest in the leadership of black and brown girls, femmes, non-binary and trans youth. And this is why I organize. Beautiful. Um, so can you talk about what you want to leave everyone with? Yeah. Um, so we're looking at divesting and investing. So divest from reactionary and shallow responses to youth bad behavior. Invest in holistic support that isn't patronizing or trivializing by hiring more school counselors who actually have time to counsel. Divest from law enforcement in schools. Invest in very intentional restorative justice practices. And at the end of the day, just listen to the students because they are the masters of their own experiences. And before we close out, we just want to show everyone a really quick video. Um, could we roll the footage, please? Duty to fight! It is our duty to fight! It is our duty to win! It is our duty to win! We must love and protect one another! We must love and protect each other! We have nothing to lose but our chain! We have nothing to lose but our chain! We have nothing to lose but our chains! We have nothing to lose but our chains. Thank you. Thank you.